Okay, so hello everybody and welcome to July's webinar on storytelling for business success. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are today. I'm Sophie Thompson, co-founder and CEO of Virtual Speech, which is an online platform that blends e-learning with AI practice exercises, which are available both online and in virtual reality. But this isn't a promotional webinar, this is purely educational. Um, as always, if you're joining us live and have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box or into the chat, and I'll make sure that we ask our guest. Today, we're joined by Javier Bernard, who is going to talk to us about crafting compelling narratives, and I'm very much looking forward to this. Javier is the founder of Speak and Span, a training center for public speaking skills, and he has been training managers on how to excel as presenters since 1998. Speak and Span offers corporate and personal training sessions to clients such as Airbus, Procter & Gamble, KPMG, Pfizer, Coca-Cola, to name just a few. Um, he has trained over 8,000 individuals and analysed more than 25,000 recordings of their presentations. Javier is also adjunct professor of communication at IE Business School in Madrid. He holds a PhD in communication and a master's degree in corporate communication, as well as degrees in law and economics and business administration. So evidently, we are in excellent hands to explore storytelling. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a joy to be with all of you today. And um, the first thing I would like to dispel is a myth, because storytelling is a concept which is used everywhere today, and very few people know what they're talking about. If, if you allow me to be so so crude, so most people will say, "Well, that presentation has no storytelling, meaning it's boring." or it doesn't have a clear flow. That's not storytelling. Storytelling is telling stories. The other thing I see very often is storytelling applied to businesses, to brands. Okay, that's also different. That's not storytelling, really. That is it's got to do with marketing. And let me show you what I mean. Okay. I'm going to share this with you. This. All right. So... We all know about positioning. So positioning means having a key benefit. So you need a benefit for consumers, for users. And your brand is that. Now, imagine, for instance, Nike, they say, just do it. Their positioning is, I give you everything you need. Just go ahead and be yourself, you can do it. So trust yourself. Okay, that's a fantastic positioning with a very clear benefit. Now, what they do is they have, from that positioning, they develop advertising ideas, which can be one idea for all their campaigns, but normally they, they change different ideas. So I'm going to show you a couple of ads, Nike ads, so you see what I mean. So, okay, so this is one. <laughs> On Wednesday, October 2nd, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Come on. The CAT scan revealed that my condition has spread into my abdomen. <clears throat> For now, I must focus on my treatment. However, I want all of you to know that I intend to beat this disease. And further, I intend to ride again as a professional cyclist. Beautiful, beautiful ad. I, I'm overcoming all my difficulties. Is this an advertising idea? So let's use Lance Armstrong before he did all the nasty things in, with his body. And, and as, as an example of, of what, what we do. Now, they can do that or they can do another one, which is, for instance, this one. This, there are quite all these ones, but so this is the... Right, I'm, 
I'm not going to play the whole thing. If you're interested, it's very easy to find. So Brazil football team at the airport playing, playing football. Team. So they 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 do silly things at the airport, and then at the end they go just do it again. So that's another advertising idea. Hey, let's use the Brazilian football team playing as if they were kids messing up at the airport. Okay, fantastic, great advertising idea. Now, is that a story? Yes. But it's not brand storytelling in the sense that we tend to understand it. Because, again, brand storytelling is probably advertising ideas. It's not, I'm going to tell you how my dad founded this company and how he got through everything to get us to where we are today. Okay, yeah, that's a story. If that's a story about your company, your brand, okay, use it. Again, yeah, okay, that's storytelling for your company. But it's not storytelling in business. All right, no. So now that we've got that out of the way, what is storytelling? Storytelling is encapsulating your message for that audience, particular audience, which may be all your consumers, in the beautiful container, which is a story. And since we're, since we're talking about storytelling, let me tell you a story. A few years back, I'm sitting on the couch with my friend Louis at his apartment in Culver City in Los Angeles. It's a hot, humid September afternoon. We are having the windows open because the air conditioning is not working. I can see I, the kids playing in the playground. I can hear the birds chirping outside and I can smell the salty breeze coming in from the Pacific. We are relaxing after a hard day of shopping for me because I'm visiting my friend in LA. I'm just going to all the malls I can go. Um, my friend is tired from working the, the entire week. He works at the FBI offices in Los Angeles. He's the legal advisor for the FBI. And we are tired. So we're watching that football game on, on the telly. It's uh, the Rams versus the Redskins. My friend Louis is a short, stout, very powerful person with deep penetrating eyes and a permanent smile on that says... I like you, but watch out because I may jump on you at any time. Before working for the FBI and the, the legal department, he was a poor bo boy from El Salvador who escaped the civil war with his with his daughter, daughter and his mom and his sister. His dad left them. His mom was an alcoholic, so he didn't have it very easy, but he managed to finish the law at Notre Dame in Chicago. And after that, he was a undercover agent in Los Angeles, in drug Latino drug gangs, gangs. So we're tired. We don't want to cook. And we decide to order a pizza. So Louis gets on the phone with Domino's. And all I can hear him say is yes, 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 yes. He's saying yes to all the toppings. You know, in the US, if you don't have 50 toppings, you're nobody. So he's saying yes, all the toppings you can, we can have. Domino's says, you'll have the pizza in 20 minutes. So fine. Hangs up the phone. We keep watching the game. 20 minutes go by. No pizza. So I look at my friend and say, Louis, where's the pizza, man? He says, don't worry. Domino's never failed me yet. He will be here any minute. We keep watching the game. Another 20 minutes go by. Still no pizza. Now we are hungry and a little bit annoyed. 20 minutes more. Where's the pizza? Now we're very hungry and very annoyed. And 10 minutes after that, bing, bang. Now I have a first row view to the scene because the apartment is not very, very big. There's the, the couch the television, the door, and, and the, the room, and the kitchen. So my friend springs from the couch and goes to the door, and I'm thinking, whoever's on the other side of that door, Louis is going to slash his throat. So Louis opens the door, and he's the pizza delivery boy with this red plastic Domino's jacket on, with a look on his face like nothing is wrong in the world, slouching with the pizza. And Louis says to him, you are 50 minutes late. What's going on? And the guy goes, well, excuse me, sir. You know, my, my previous delivery was at a friend of mine. So it just took me a little while longer. You can imagine. And there's a lot of traffic out there. But don't worry, the pizza's fine. You're going to love it. So Louis looks him in the eye and says, if you want to deliver pizza, you have to be the best pizza delivery boy in the world. So the guy shrinks. I says, yes, sir. So the, the exchange happens. He leaves without a tip, of course. Louis slams it on the guy. He comes back to the couch with the pizza. And I say to Louis, man, you just destroyed the poor kid. He's probably making like $50 a day. 
and you just destroyed your self-confidence. What's going on? And we just brushes the thing aside with away with his heart. Don't worry about it. So we keep watching the game, and, and his phrase keeps dangling in my mind. The best pizza delivery boy in the world. What a menial thing to say with someone, to someone with such a menial job. What are you talking about? The next day I'm flying back to Madrid. I'm on the flight looking out the window. And his phrase come back, comes back to me. The best pizza delivery boy in the world. The best pizza delivery boy in the world. And suddenly it dawns on me. And that's when I realized how Louis had got from nowhere, from the very poor kid in El Salvador escaping a war, to the big guy in the FBI. And what I learned that day is, if you want to achieve anything, you have to go through every step to that anything as if every step was life or death, as if you had to be the best pizza delivery boy in the world. So that's my story. It's a real story. My friend Louis passed away many years ago from cancer. But he was an amazing personality and going out with him in Los Angeles was always a problem because he was always carrying his gun, of course, and he was very aggressive and <laughs> just looking for trouble, even though he was working for, for the law. And we told this story at, at his funeral because it, it revealed so much about, about the guy. Now, this is a story. And when do I use this? I use this, imagine, I'm, I'm at a company, we just restructured, and maybe we merged with another company and people don't know what they're doing anymore. They, they don't know the ways. It's one step forward, two steps back, and this frustration. And what do we do next? Okay, so imagine I tell them, guys, you need to pay attention to detail. You need to make sure everything is working. I know processes are changing. This is not easy, but please pay attention to detail. Okay, fine, Mr. Boss, they would say. But if I tell them that story about my friend, it's going to stay in there forever. It's gonna, I'm going to screw my message onto their brains forever because this is what storytelling does. As I said, storytelling is the best package to deliver any message to any audience. And there's several reasons why, why uh, this, work, this works. Okay, reason number one is got to do with with this, which you may be familiar with. It's the, we call it this, the Heidersimmel illusion. It's an experiment in psychology run in 1944. So here it goes. Maybe you can write in the chat what you saw in there. So we have some opinions from participants today. Mm. I can tell you, around 3% of people just see shapes moving on a plane. The rest see all kinds of funny things. And what I always see is the small triangle and the circle. Uh, so no, the big triangle and the circle had a beautiful relationship. But they split up. And then the circle starts a new relationship with this with the small triangle because they're friends with the big guy. They go visit him and he's very jealous. So he tries to get the circle back and violently. But the small triangle is very witty. So he manages to escape with the circle again. And the big guy is so annoyed that he destroyed the 
destroys the place where they shared so many mo moments together. See? So I always see this as a marital relationship, basically father and son. People saw, see all, all kinds of different things. Now, why does this happen? I'll tell you in a moment. But first, what is a story? Sophie, can you please tell me what you did today, up until now? Oh, so what boy. was your day? <laughs> What was my day? Um, I woke up and then I had a shower and I had some breakfast, which was yogurt and strawberries. And then um, I started working and here I am still. I stopped halfway through for lunch. Um, but yes, now it's the end of the working day. And then um, later on, I have to go to a university to speak. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. Now, is that a story? <laughs> that uh, was very story. descriptive. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we, no, descriptive is good in storytelling, but but why is that not a story? Because we're missing something. Okay, let me tell you what the elements of a story are. Um, goes, right. So first, you have a protagonist, which is Sophie. Maybe some other characters. Then you have a setting. So place and time. Then there is a journey with actions and events that occurred to the protagonist and maybe the other characters. And then this is the most important thing. And this is why your day is not a story, Sophie. You need conflict. No conflict, no story. Every story has conflict. Because of that, there's change in the protagonist. The, that person is not the same when the story ends as when the story started. And then there is, a there is a lesson we draw from that change. So conflict leads to change, which leads to the lesson. Now, this is what in script writing we call the story arc, which is normal. And then there's conflict here, here somewhere. And then there's a new normal. I'm sure you've heard about this, the, the story arc. They give it other names, but... It's always like this. Something happens and the protagonist's life is thrown into conflict. So what may have been a story in your day? Imagine, Sophie, you're late for something and you don't want to be late because it's a very important interview. Or you are riding a moped and you crash and you, you hurt yourself. See, So these are conflicts. Now, conflict, you may be thinking of a conflict. I need to have an earthquake or or my dog dying, or someone, something horrible. Not necessarily. So conflict may be a big crisis, like the ones I just described. It can be a small obstacle. It can be a challenge. It can be a discovery. So you realize something suddenly. So for instance, in my story with, with the pizza, with my friend, the, the protagonist, let me share this back with you. The protagonist, who is the protagonist? My friend or me? What do you think, Sophie? Sophie is the student today. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? So, who is the protagonist in my story with the pizza? Um, your friend? Uh, no. See, it was a trick question. <laughs> uh, it looks like my friend is, but it's not. It's me because I'm the one who changes. See, I've led a very easy life. Okay, I've had my ups and downs, but okay. so my parents loved me and I uh, had a dog who loved me and a um, beautiful career, which I enjoy what I'm doing. My kids are beautiful. I ride my mountain bike as often as I can and I love it. So my life has been easy. My friend's life was a disaster and he managed to push through. So the one changing in that story is me. I realized something, see? So the protagonist mm -hmm. and the setting is his apartment. Yes, and then the journey is what happens. So we're hungry, we're watching TV, we're on a cook, so we order a pizza, and things happen. Conflict is that the pizza is late. Now, whenever there is conflict, there is an antagonist, of course. And that antagonist in, in my story is not dominoes. It's time. So the antagonist can also be something, uh, mm -hmm. an, an abstract something. And then the, the change in me is I realize, okay, it's a bit, extreme because I, I of course I know that you have to do things carefully and, and go through every step paying attention to detail but this story helps to magnify that message which is very very common sense stories don't have 
messages that change your world. They they have they have normal messages, but the reason they they stick in there is that they're delivered in the form of a story. So the change is clear. I, I I see things differently, and there's a lesson I draw, which I can apply to business. Now, why do we pay attention to stories? This is a very interesting thing. You tell a story in a room, and there's no sound. When you do a pre presentation, there's background noise. So people are shuffling papers or tapping or moving in their chairs. When there's a story, there's no sound. Everyone's paying full attention. And why is this? So number one reason for this is that we are geared to listen to, to, to listen to stories because we learn through them. So when there was no PowerPoint many thousands of years ago, there was not even writing. So how did we learn things? in the form of a story. It's easy to remember a story because it has a time flow. It starts and then something mm -hmm. happens. So it's very easy to follow. Past, present, and future is a structure in which no one gets lost in a presentation. It may be in the form of a story, it may be just past, present, and future of a project, but it's, it's not easy to get lost in that. So we remember that very clearly. Now, from this point of view, stories are a way to understand the problems we face in our lives, and to acquire the methods to overcome those problems with the difficulties along the way. So this is why we're stuck to stories because we need them to survive, to survive in the wild. And if you think about this, the, the stories we, we learned as kids, they all have a message we can apply to life. Mm -hmm. For instance, the three little piggies. The three little piggies have a very clear message, which is hard work pays. Now, you can tell me that as a mom. Okay, mom, thank you very much. But if you tell me the story with the piggies, okay, it's going to stick in there. It's so clear. It's full of images. It's also working because it's, there's lots of emotions in there, to which I will refer in a moment. But the things we learned as kids in the form of stories are going to stay there forever. For instance, Hansel and Gretel, with the witch that wants to eat them, with the candy house, so attractive, and they're kicked out of home because their parents have no means to, to feed them. See, don't trust strangers because they're going to eat you. See, it's so clear. Okay, I'm never, talk, I'm never going to talk to a stranger if you tell me that as a five-year-old kid. There's another interesting message in that story, which I think I'm the only one in the world who, who found, found, that, found it, which is, you remember, Hansel drops little crumbs of bread yeah. so that they can find their way back. It's just, it's, then what happens to the crumbs of bread? The birds eat them. So even the best plan fails. Oh. <laughs> don't do breadcrumbs do pebbles Hansel I'm sure Greta Thank would have done it differently <laughs> so we, we, we need stories to survive and this is the number one reason why we're stuck to the storyteller when he's mm. delivering his, his story because we need to survive now the second reason is got to do with okay let me show you this now it's got to do with this Mm. To Pierce Morgan being Pierce Morgan, Fox aired a special on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle covering their royal departure, and Pierce sprinkled a wee bit of shade. He spoke about Meghan calling her one of the most ruthless social climbers he's ever met in his entire life, and said, quote, the moment Meghan Markle no longer perceives you to be useful, it doesn't matter how close a family member or friend you are, you get chopped. She's done it to almost all her old friends. She's now acquired new friends, Oprah, George Clooney, David Beckham, Elton John, and she's done it to her ex-husband. She's done it to most of her family, 99% of them. This isn't shade, this is a whole eclipse. But okay, Pierce also says if Meghan Markle thinks that she's going to emerge from this as some kind of Princess Diana figure, she needs to think again. She's going to end up like a mini royal Kim Kardashian. Great, what do you think of that, Sophie? Did you like it? I mean, it got my attention. I didn't necessarily agree with it, but it sounded very yeah, dramatic. So, so you, you say, you, okay, you've been very polite and very diplomatic now, because most people would say, I don't like gossip. You know, excuse me, gossip is bad. You're talking about others without them being present. This is not nice. No, I'm going to give you permission today to gossip because gossip is good for you. Mm -hmm. Gossiping is a survival tool. And stories, we like stories, is another, another big reason why we like stories, because we need to know about others. We spend most of our social time talking about ourselves and things that happen to others. And we do this because we're social animals. We're primates. Besides being social, we're primates. Now, in our 
tribes and our groups, our roles are not innate, nor are they permanent. So you can be born very poor, like my friend Louis, and then become a big guy in, in, a, in a big company. You may be born um, an aristocrat and then spend your last days under a bridge. So it, our roles change. If you are an ant, a working ant or a working bee, you're going to be a working bee the rest of your life. You cannot change. You can never become the queen. We can. And a large part of that depends on others. So what are others thinking about me? What are they feeling? What are their intentions, their motivations? I need to know about that if I want to have stability in a group or to, to climb the ladder in, in that group. It's so important. There's a part of our brain, which we call theory of mind module, which is a very silly name. Psychologists use fancy names for very simple things. It's just empathy. <laughs> so empathy is called theory of mind. And theory of mind module is a part of your brain that takes care of that. So we've developed that because otherwise we would die. And there's these two things which are very important to us, which is made choice and status in that group. So it's love and power, love and power. If you think about this drama, everything is power and love. Hamlet. Everyone dies in Hamlet. It's a, it's a disaster. But what is Hamlet? It's not, it's not power and love. So his mom gets together with the uncle, love, who's killed dad previously, so power to get the throne. And then Ophelia, suicide, and all these horrible things happen in Hamlet. But it's power and love, power and choice of mate. So we focus on that. This is what we're glued to stories. Now, if you read El Hola in Spain, which is called Hello in the UK, and any gossip magazine and any yellowish newspapers, they are all about this. So who is this very powerful person, maybe an actor or an actress, and what are they doing with their love life? We, we want to know. Now, the chances of me getting together with Meghan Markle are 0 0.0000000001. But still, I'm attracted to that person because she's powerful and maybe which is not available anymore. But but see, it's I need to know what's going on. Now, when we were 15 in the tribe, it was essential. Now that we're 8 billion, it's still essential, although it's not relevant because it doesn't matter what happens with Meghan Markle to me in that sense. See? So gossiping is good. You need to gossip. <laughs> so you oh. talk about others. It's fantastic. Now, malicious gossip of the type we just saw that's a very, very small part of gossiping. And we shouldn't even call it gossip. We should call it so social chat or whatever. But, but again, this is one of the big reasons why we're into storytelling. This is why we're glued to the storyteller, because we need to know what's going on in the group. Hey. Yeah, it's in our know. nature. It's in our nature, yes. Mm. So now we know two big reasons for, for, for liking stories. Number one, we need them to survive in the wild. Number two, we need them to survive in a group. Now, there's another story, another reason, but for that, I'm going to tell you the start of another story. So, I'm driving my shiny gray 125cc Vespa. It's 8 a.m. It's still dark. I'm going to university, and the pavement is wet from the previous night's rain. It's a very dull street. It's one way, and I can see gray buildings, a few corner shops, nothing more. Traffic is intense that hour of the morning. And I can feel the wind in my hands. I forgot my gloves because I was in a hurry. I just dropped, fall, fall off my bed. I can hear the hum of the engine in my white AGV helmet going, mm, and the, the crack of the gears as I change in, the, in, in that Vespa. I'm thinking of not arriving late for class and also that that night I'm going for, to the movies with my friend. So the question is, where were you now, Sophie? <laughs> you have to say in the street with me. Yeah, you, I guess so. Yeah, because okay, I'm just imagining it. <laughs> okay, if you say something different, I would be in trouble. So now this is what we call transportation, which is another reason why we like storytelling. So whenever we are told the story, our minds are transported mentally and also physically aided by vivid mental imagery. 
Now, I say psychologically, so mentally, of course, but also physically. It's like when you go to the movies, you're sitting in your seat in the movies, you're in the movie, you don't realize who's sitting next to you anymore. But you're stuck to that film. Why is that? Because we're transported. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to a movie house with lots of popcorn and Coke, I, I, I profoundly dislike that, but there's nothing I can do. I went to the movies just last, last Saturday, and a guy next to me was eating popcorn. <laughs> And then sipping is called, and I couldn't concentrate. So I tend not to go to the movies a lot. I tend to watch them, so they're at home, but there's no popcorn. But if there's no popcorn, you're right in the movie. So we're transported. And we're transported, we like to be transported because our, our minds are very lazy. So we like to be entertained. Our verbal memory is lazy, lazy. We dislike the abstract concepts and we like the telling of things that happen to people, events, actions. So we're drawn into that. We're transported because we have lazy verbal memories. Yes. Mm -hmm. So transportation, again, is another big reason why we like storytelling. Now, there's other reasons, but these three are, are the big ones. So survival in the wild as a group and then we like to be entertained we were transported very easily because our minds our verbal memory is not it doesn't like to work very much and this is why powerpoint presentations tend to be so boring and this is why we like stories now how do you use storytelling during a, a presentation okay so the first thing we need to know is how do you structure a story and let me give you the the parts of a story there's, there's many ways to, to describe the parts of a story. What I gave you before are the elements. Remember, there's, there's a protagonist, there's a setting, there's a journey, there's conflict, there's, there's change, and there's a lesson. Those are the elements we need. But the parts when you actually tell the, the story itself. So the parts are, first, there's, there's a setup. Then there is an incident. And this is where, where conflict is. So the protagonist's life is thrown into conflict. Then there is what I call the movie phase. Now, I'll tell you about this phase in a moment. And then there's the climax. And then there's the aftermath. Again, if you check what Pixar do, or if you, if you read books on, on script writing, there's many more parts. You can get up to 18 parts. I've, I've seen in one of these script writing books, but, but this is the essence of storytelling. So you get a setup first. So about the protagonist, where he is, how long ago. When I start with the pizza, I say, I'm with my friend Louis in his couch at his apartment. And it's September and it's hot. That would be the setup. Now, when you do the setup, it's important not to start. Let me stop sharing this. It's important not to start saying, my friend Louis, he used to work for the FBI, and he was a very strong guy, not only in his uh, physically, but also in his personality. That's a boring start. Story starts with something happening. Check James Bond movies. There's an action scene in every movie. Sometimes it doesn't even have to do with the, with the plot itself. It's just an action scene for the, same, for the sake of it. But it starts with things happening. So I'm not describing my friend. First, I'm telling what I'm doing, which I'm sitting on the couch and I'm lazy with my friend that day. So that would be the setup. Then something happens in, in, the, in my story with the pizza. The, the, the incident is that, hey, the pizza is not getting there. Then comes the movie. So there is a, I see this very often in storytelling, especially in corporate storytelling, which is there's not enough of this. The movie phase is what happens between the incident and the climax. I call it the movie phase because movies are all about this. Something happens in like the first three minutes, and then there's the climax at the end. So Zoom is giving me funny messages. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we okay, cut fine, out so for fine. about one second. Or all okay, forget about that. So let's keep going. So, so I was saying, sometimes there's not enough of this movie phase. So the protagonist fights against the, the conflict created by the incident. He's trying, but he can't. And then sometimes you get to the all is lost moment, like in Snow White, she dies. That's not the climax in Snow White. The climax is she gets 
the kiss and then she comes back to life see so so the movie snow white is the the setup is she's there with her friends the animals at the well in in the castle with her horrible stepmom and then she sees the prince as she falls in love that's that's the, the setup then comes the incident which is she's driven to the woods by the hunter to be slain under instructions from a stepmom and he takes pity on her he sets he sets her free that's a disaster of an incident conflict is huge there's no money, there's no family. The only family she has wants to kill her. Then uh, she's in the woods alone at night. She hears strange noises and no friends. It's a disaster. It's a perfect disaster. And then between that and the, the, the kiss, the moment of the kiss, that's the movie. And so many things happen in Snow White. But in Snow White, there's two paths. The movie face follows two paths. One, it's a nice path. She becomes friends with the with the with the dwarves and with the, all the animals in the forest and then the other path is the witch is plotting how to kill her for this time for good and then the, she, the witch dies she's pushed off a cliff by snow white's friends she's already dead and they're so sad and comes the prince and then she kisses her. okay so that's the that's the climax and then we have the after let me show you this again so the climax the climax is when success failure or discovery happen and this is important to realize sometimes it's not success like in snow white sometimes it's a disaster like seven that horrible movie where um, i hope it's not a spoiler for most of you but but it ends very very badly so but there's a lesson coming from that also so success failure or discovery in my story with the pizza the the climax is not my friend slamming the door on the pizza guy the climax is me on that flight realizing what had happened the day before. Success, failure, or discovery. And from that discovery, I draw the lesson, which I apply at, at the end of my story. And then the aftermath, the aftermath, it may be there or not. So in my story, there's no aftermath. In Snow White, the aftermath is they ride into the sunset. And they marry and have kids and so happily ever, happy ever after. So, so don't leave them hanging is the, the question you should answer with the with the aftermath. So again, these parts are very, very essential. I'm sure if I hadn't explained them to you, you would have come up with them anyway, because we all know instinctively what are the parts in, in the story. But it's good to know because if you don't, if you're not familiar with this and you try to craft a story to tell your teams, then what do you do? So you need that. Now a story will last three to five minutes. More than that is your storyteller and, and you, you, all you're doing is telling stories nonstop. Maybe the, an evening of storytelling. But if you want to insert a story in a presentation, it works so well again to deliver any message. Now, how do you tell your story? So we've seen what it is, how it works, and then the parts of it. Now, how do you tell it? I'm not going to go into detail in, in, in what relates to how to tell the story, but I'm just going to give you a few hints. So number one, this is the most important one. If you only had to remember one thing about telling your story is this, you need to use your senses. If you think about this, our memories are composed of inputs we receive through, your, through our five senses. So if you want your audience to be with you in that apartment or that, that, that moment, you need to make it sensorial. So I said to you, I can see the kids outside. I can hear the birds chirping. I can smell the breeze, which is not true because the Pacific was very far away from Culver City. <laughs> but I can invent a few things. But I could have also said it was a brown couch and the walls are not very clean and it's... Uh, it's a chandelier hanging from... Okay, don't give them too much detail. If you do, then stop imagining. So give them enough for them to get into your story. So again, I'm telling you, so the pavement is wet. It's dark still. It's 8 a.m. I can feel the wind in my face. Dull, dull apartment. So you, you start to imagine things and then you're with me. So number one, make it sensorial. Use your five senses. Number two, use the present tense. Now, some people find this very, very difficult. And I've never been able to understand why. Because, excuse me, it happened yesterday. What do you mean I need to use the present tense? Well, 
two things happen when you use the present tense. Number one, you as the storyteller are going to get deeper into that situation. So it's easier for you to tell that, that story. And for us, the audience, it's so much easier to get into it because if it's happened in the past, it's not as interesting. If it's happening now, I'm there with you. It's like in the movies. Movies happen at the moment. Right. Yeah, when, when you're watching it. And then the next thing is, what do you do with your nonverbals? So let me write there. And NVs, with NVs, I refer to nonverbals. Now, your nonverbals, okay. When you... Two presentations, there's there's many things you should bear in mind as to what you do with hands, with your feet, how much do you move, how often, how many steps, what do you do with your stance, your arms, your eye contact, etc. Now, when you tell a story, this is not that relevant. The only thing I suggest you don't do is anything repetitive, because repetitive will distract the audience always. And I see this very often. People start walking left to right because they're stressed. And then the audience, instead of paying attention to the story, they're paying attention to their repetitive movement. So don't do anything repetitive. But the most important thing you have when you tell a story is your voice and the use of pauses, which is related to what you do with your voice. Now, for this, I find virtual speech an amazing tool to rehearse because what it does, virtual speech, if, if you're using goggles, you can also do it in without goggles. But with goggles, it's even more interesting because you see things in 3D. You see the audience and then you tell them your story. And then you do it again. And again, and again, and again. And the, the tool, maybe you should be saying this, sorry, but this is my experience with it. So the tool tells you if you're going too fast, if you're using fillers, which are a disaster, fillers like, um, 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 you know, because they distract the audience. It's like someone lit up the lights in that movie house. And also the, the use of pauses. Now, there's a big, big problem with storytelling in business, which is we think that, because the story is there because it's happened to us. This is very important. You need to tell stories that happen to you. If you tell the story about your grandpa starting the company, it's, okay, maybe, but it's not the same because you're not as much into it as when it ha it's happened to you. So you think, okay, it's happened to me. So I, I've got it in my mind. I just open my mouth and, and tell them the story. It's a disaster because you need to make sure it flows. You need to make sure it's good. It's, it's interesting. You need to make sure that you add drama. And for that, you need to rehearse. And rehearsing with this feedback from, from virtual speech works wonders. In my experience with my students at, at IE Business School. So those three things, if you're thinking, how do I tell my story? Is remember, you need to use your senses, use the present tense, and use your voice inflection. Thrill them with your voice. And I need to adapt to the audience. So if I'm telling a story to five-year-olds, I'm going to do this. If I'm telling a story to the, the board of directors who are the owners of the company and they're 65 plus, and I do all these things, they're going to think I'm funny. So handle with care. But you need to rehearse your stories. And with this, um, I've covered what I wanted to, to cover. And now I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions that, that may have come up from our great yes. audience today so thank you very much um so yes we do have a few a couple of questions so firstly i'd like to shout out to helen who is the star student because she knew who the protagonist was <laughs> when i didn't she put it into the question um and she also mentioned about the power of storytelling and how it connects with emotions for successful storytelling um so then we have a couple of questions um so do you have suggestions for how to make the start of the story interesting so that people want to listen to it? I think you did actually cover that a bit after mm. they'd asked that, but if there's anything you want to add there. A very important thing I would add to what I just already said, which is remember, start with things happening. There, there's mm. action happening already. Is shut up before you start. So say nothing. So you've got a, a 50 plus audience, you stand there, you glance the room, When I was a kid, my dad always said to me, Javier, you're going to like storytelling. <laughs> so you start with, so shut up and then start with something that grabs your attention, which is remember you or things happening already. Mm -hmm. I, I have another story, which is this, this happened to me a few months ago, but my, my eldest daughter 
She drives our cars because she, so we do have three kids and she's, she's 25. She's still at home. And uh, I um, this morning I wake up and I go to my computer to check my emails. It's Saturday morning because I didn't have time to check them Friday night. And I get an email from the Madrid government, Madrid um, region's government, which is a traffic fine. And I was so, so, what a traffic fine. I didn't do anything. So, okay, so I start with that. I'm saying, my daughter Carlota drives our cars. No, I'm saying, I'm sitting, what, reviewing my emails. And then I tell them about my daughter, et cetera. Yeah, the present tense really coming in. Yes, yeah, in the present tense, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have another question. Is there a difference between telling stories to friends versus telling stories in the workplace? Or is the structure the same? It's the same, but it's easier with your friends because they don't they don't care what happens. Now you have to shine when you tell a story to an audience. It's it's interesting if you have a, a story you want to use, tell it to your friends first, so you know what to polish, what works and what doesn't work. Maybe maybe it's too long. Maybe you need to shorten it. Maybe you need to add more details. Did you imagine things? Where were you? Were you with me here and there? But, it, but it's the same. I'm sure we all have a, a storytelling friend, a storyteller. I, I know one. She, I, it, she's the queen of all parties because we're sitting there. You know, parties at our age, you don't stand up drinking anymore and dancing. You just sit in couches after <laughs> dinner. So and she starts, she opens her mouth and she, let me tell you what happened to me yesterday. And everyone's glued to that person because she's a great storyteller. And, and she's just managing the present tense very well. She's giving us lots of details, which is another interesting thing. So it's not only senses you should use. It's also things, names, brands, distances, measurements. So for instance, if I'm telling you I'm having, I'm having a drink, I'm not having a drink. I'm having a Coke, a Diet Coke. I don't say I am in L.A. Okay, maybe. But if I say I'm in Culver City in Los Angeles, probably half the audience doesn't know where Culver, Culver City is. It doesn't matter. If I give you details, you, you start to imagine things. You, you make up Culver City in your mind. You picture your Culver City. So give them details. It was mm -hmm. so wide. It was as wide as two football fields. See? And then whoosh, you're there with me. It's easier. Yeah, easy to imagine. Great, thank you. Um, while we're talking about stories and tenses in stories, um, Julia has asked, how do you use the present in a story if you are talking about a story of a third person? For example, if you're talking to a customer about another customer's experience. Okay, in that case, you do use the past, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I, I just used it with my story with, with my friend Louis. So I'm sitting with my friend, we're watching a, a football game, we order a pizza, and then I say, my friend Louis was a very poor kid from El Salvador. I don't say, my friend Louis is a very poor kid from El Salvador. He goes, excuse me, so is he working for the FBI as a kid or what's going on? This is confusing. So if you're talking to a client about a client, then you say, which is, by the way, great use of stories. So success stories with clients, so you get new, new clients. Um, I'm with this client that is planned, and he's telling me about what's going on every day with his in his production. And they need to stop it every day because these things are, are not working. And then he goes on to tell me how three years back they were using another process which was not working either. But then they thought I'm using the past now because I'm referring to something within that story that happened in the past, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked any tips on making stories more visual when verbally telling them should this be all in the setup not necessarily you can for instance I can describe the flight I was in I can describe the so I described the, the Domino's guy when he came into, into the movie I could have described what is, there's not many many scenes in in that story in the sense that we're always in, it's just two places but but use as much senses as you can for instance sophie can you please tell me about your favorite vacation in place use your senses um okay so last summer 
I went to um, Norway with my family and we were on a cruise. So we went in to different locations um, and we we would wake up in different locations every day. Uh, the sites were beautiful. Um, there were like big green fields everywhere. Uh, the air was very crisp and fresh which is how i like it to be um and it felt very like clean air as well um which is quite different to uh the uk i would say um so yeah i was with my my parents and my two brothers and um their partners as well um so it felt like a very loving environment to be in and we were celebrating my granddad at the time as well Okay, this is so interesting. So, so what do you do? Sorry, this happens all the time. So you just sight and touch, and most mm-hmm. of it was sight because most of us are, are very, very visual. Of course, there's this seventy percent of visual. I don't know where that research comes from, but it's just like urban knowledge. And you describe to us that place using mostly what you see, what you're seeing, what mm-hmm. you saw, and then you, the touch. You know, what we're missing there. So we could hear the waves crashing in the fjords every morning when we woke up. And, that ship mm-hmm. it was a ship then eating there was fantastic so mackerel was of course so so sour but also we had it with milk like they like to do up there so that's a taste and then what else you're missing so you could you could sort of smell taste and um yeah that's it. that's it see so just know when you describe anything again don't give them too much detail because then they stop imagining but know that you're going to mostly use this. And we also need other things. Okay, if you're not eating anything, don't, don't force it. Okay, I need to tell them how this tastes. So we're going to make up, no. But yeah. Sen- sensorial information is what will let them dive into your story. And by the way, this is when you have fun, the storyteller, because you're remembering those things in detail. So it's like it's happening again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm also showing how practice is important <laughs> as well, rather than making up stories on the spot. Yes. So yeah, the importance of practice. Um, we have a question. Oh, we have three more questions. Um, can you give us some concrete tips for finding stories that we can use in business situations? We all have lots of stories in us, but how do we go about locating or extracting those from our own personal treasure chest of stories? Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing you need to to find out is what message do you want to convey to that particular audience? What is your purpose? What do you want them to go away with? You you message that, that one thing. Now, once you have that, you need to think, what has happened to me in my life, which is linked to that lesson I want to transmit to these guys? Okay, this is very easy to say. So how do you manage that? What you do is you put yourself at a moment in time and the place. From that situation will probably come stories. So for instance, I was living, so my first job was, was away from home. I was, I was in Brussels. I was working for Procter & Gamble and everything changed for me. I had new friends, a new girlfriend, had a car. I didn't have a car before because it was my first job. I traveled a lot. I didn't travel that much before. I learned a new language. I picked up friends, new tastes because I shared a flat with a guy from India. So everything was spicy and very, very spicy. And everything was completely new. So if I place myself at that moment, then I have tons of stories that come up. Now, maybe I don't find the particular one. Uh, th- that contains that message I want to deliver. So there's other, other ways of coming up with stories besides placing yourself at a moment in time and, and place, which is think of things that happen to you. So when you were especially happy, when you were especially sad, when you overcame a big obstacle, when you met new friends, when you were moved by something, when you were especially proud of something, when you made a fool of yourself, so this, these things have got to do with emotions. Mm-hmm. Now, I said before, emotions are key in storytelling. One of the big reasons why we're, we, we like stories is that they're choke full of emotions, positive, negative emotions. But we, we emotions move people to action. Facts are tough. They need, you need to digest them in there. Emotions just work. So there, there's this, this triggers you can use. So, okay, let me think about a moment where 
I was that. For instance, at the moment, I was extremely proud of myself. It was just two weeks ago because I finished the big mountain bike race in the Pyrenees. It's called the Transpeer. It's seven days, 800 kilometers, 18,000 meters of climbing in those seven days. And I was I was especially proud because the year before I tried and I crashed on the third stage and I broke a rib and I spent the night at the hospital and I said, I'm never going to do this again. But then I, I came back home and the first thing I did is I signed up for this year. So I made it. Now, I'm, I'm especially proud of that. I have to still find lessons that come from that story. There's a few. Because for me, it wasn't that hard. But for most people, that's a very big adventure. Because I, I mean, it wasn't that hard because I trained a lot. So I, I think of those moments. Let me think of about a moment when I was really inspired. So my dad telling me stories about the civil war in Spain, because he was very young when it was 15, 16, 17 years old. So he told me all these stories. I was so moved by things that happened all the time. Or let me think about a moment where I was I was very impressed. I was I was so happy. Now from, from those moments, you may very easily develop a story. First, let me give let me tell you one of these. So we have I said three kids. My youngest is now 18. You know, they grow and then they don't think you're a hero anymore. But anyway, when she was 12, <laughs> she used to go on trips with her friends, school trips. And this one trip, she's with five girls in an apartment. And she called us every night. So this one night I pick up the phone and she says, she says Sol, how are you doing? She says, Daddy, I'm in love. I said, what do you mean you're in love? You're 12. And she says, yes, I, I met this boy and he smiled at me and I smiled at him. And I could hear friends in the background in the apartment saying, Sol, shut up. He's your dad. And then she turns and says to him, you shut up. He's my diary. <laughs> Which is a very interesting. Now, is that a story? No, but I can very easily transform it into a story because that's the that's the climactic moment. Now, how do I get a story from that? I think, what is this climactic moment opposite to? Which is probably the beginning of my story. If I make up a story about that around that moment, which is all teenagers are stupid. And they think you're not cool and they don't see. So I could, instead of her being 12, which is reality, I could make her be 13 and then it would work even better. So think about moments in your life. Everything, sorry, every week something happens to you, which is story worthy. Every week I have a one note list of things that happened to me. I note it down and then with a potential message that may come out from that episode. And then, okay, I need a story about friendship. Okay, this is it. And then again, you have to rehearse it. You need, you need to write it first and then rehearse that through virtual speech, ideally, because it works very well, but rehearse it. And then we'll have a fantastic story. You think, but my plane never crashed or I, did, I was not on drowning in the sea when I was rescued. It doesn't matter. Tiny episodes in your life constitute heavy, heavy material for stories. Mm -hmm. That's a great tip. Thank you. Um, we just have two more questions and only a couple of minutes as well. So first one from Bruce. Should a company use we or they when telling stories? Say that again. We or? We or they. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I would use I. So tell it in the, in the present tense. Are you talking about your company? Yeah, okay, okay, I understand the question. So we, we, yeah, I would use we. Yes, because as we said, stories need to be about yourself. That's when they're more credible. That's when you get more into it. And that's when you when you transform people more easily. Because the message is yours. The beauty of storytelling, among, among very many other things, is that the audience, they interpret your message in terms of their own experiences. Because whatever you're telling them about, it's happened to them. Even if you survive an earthquake, okay, maybe like zero point something percent of the world survived an earthquake, except if you're from Mexico. <laughs> but mm, I have been in dangerous situations, so I'm going to connect with that situation immediately. So I would use we. So always try to talk about things that happen to you. So you, your company, yes, we go for we. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. And final question. Um, are there any people, actors or politicians that you think tell particularly good stories so that we can then watch and learn from them? Hmm. Okay, this is a big cliche, but Obama is a great storyteller. I, whenever someone asks me who's the best presenter, I have to say Obama. You know, even if you don't like the guy, he's so good at public speaking. He's just doing yeah. everything right. Now, the, the opposite is probably Elon Musk, because the guy is so bad. He's doing everything wrong. He's, he's an amazing entrepreneur, but his public speaking is not very good. So Obama tells great stories. I think I have a story, Obama's story here. Let me see. I'm not going to... We don't have time to show you the story, but but maybe you can find it if you check online. Uh, let me see. Okay, this is it. Let me show you this. See if you can find it. This. So, okay, this is at a meeting, a political rally. Is it C-SPAN is the one, and it's a it's his campaign for the in the in the second election he won, and he's talking about a lady she, he meets and who asks him to go to a place to speak, and he's like, oh, I don't want to go there, but in the end he goes, and then he meets someone in the audience who's shouting something, and he agrees with it, and then everyone's turned turned on. Uh, it, it's it's a beautiful story. It works very well, but I I don't, cannot give you more hints as to where to find this but so uh, obama's hispan stories story in the second Obama. campaign god bless you at the end of course but this that won't tell you anything so stronger together was the claim I don't know. maybe you can find it but this is a great example okay great thank you i will make a note of that and see if we can get that out in an email to people as well if anybody right. else wants to wants to find the link um so yes we have come to the end thank you so much for all of your insights i know that i have definitely learned a thing or two um so for me i would say the key takeaway is around what storytelling is all about connection to use the present tense personal stories and senses within those stories as well um, so thank you very much. Um, anybody listening, we will be sending you the video recording of this as well. Um, and our next webinar in August is about um, using AI in education and more specifically career centres. So that one will be interesting as well. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you again, Javier, for such a brilliant session. Thank you. Have thank you. Day. Thank you for thank you all of you for for coming today. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.